All right, um, let's continue. So we have finished yesterday um, writing the server site for a simple student storage server. Uh, and we kind of writing the simple scenario for being able to store and retrieve students. So today we will tidy up a little bit and then we will write the client side. Uh, before we start um, some logistics, so um, if you feel anything can be improved in the course, so please tell us. So there was a request, for example, of a short session on how to debug Go programs. We will, we will do it uh, on the next session. Um, so we will tell a little bit about debugging and how you can do that with Go. Uh, I will tell today a little bit about testing, which is also help, helpful. Uh, so one aspect of testing is that if you write tests and you like unit tests and you're testing the functionality that you're putting in, usually that limits the amount of debugging that you have to do. So that's the general, um, the general attitude is that the more tests you have, the less debugging you have to do. So we will talk about it a little bit today as well. I also uh, requ uh, not required, in inquired uh, with the administration that we will be given extra two hours per week um, for those of you who want for a practical sessions. So we will have an extra slot sometime during the week. They haven't done it yet, but hopefully this week or next week we will, we will get it in where we can uh, talk a little bit more about some of the more advanced topics as well as more practical topics. So the first two topics that we would like to cover is the, for example, functional pointers in C++, some of the modern features of C++ with C++ 11, uh, 11 and 17, um, and also um, row sockets with C++. So they are not, those topics are not directly related to the cloud programming, but they are kind of useful to extend the knowledge of C++ that you already have. And they kind of give you a frame of reference on how to do uh, functional function pointers and how to do higher level uh, functions in C++. And then it helps with Go as well. So we will have more topics as we get the slot and we will see how we can use it. But it's also up to you. So if you have a topic or if you have something that you need to learn more about, tell me or Chris and then we will try to put it in into the plan. Some things will happen on Monday and Tuesday and then in the normal sessions and some things may happen in this extra session. So for those of you like, you know, function pointers in C++ are not strictly required for this course. You don't need to know how to do that, right? But if you are in a game programming track and you will be doing game programming in the third year then it's very useful because for event handlers and for you know a lot of things we do use function pointers uh, we use lambdas we use anonymous functions in c++ so it's something that we don't have a special subject to teach you we use it other subjects to teach you those things so we used to have multi-threading multi-threading multi-threaded programming uh, where we were doing this uh, advanced features of C++ and uh, modern features of C++ 11 and 17 but we don't have that course anymore I mean we may run it if there is a student who is keen to teach it from a master's level but we may not run it so we need to have this material somewhere uh, so some of it will be in graphics some of it will be here and some of it might be in game programming so we kind of spreading some of the topics related to C++ in other courses because there is no more C++ related um, course per se, right? Uh, so yeah, the, the bottom line is um, we I'm waiting for the notification of when this extra two hours could be during the week and then we will use it for more practical sessions. This Monday and Tuesday we split. Some of it is theory, some of it is practical. This week we're doing a lot of uh, coding and a lot of practical things. Um, next week we probably do half-half, so we'll talk a little bit about theory and then half will be dedicated to practical things and we will talk about debugging uh, next week. So if you have any suggestions or any requests, uh, don't hesitate and, and, asks, and ask me or, or Chris or just post on the, on the blackboard. So do you have any of 
top of the head uh, comments or questions or suggestions? Yeah. GDP. Yep. So debugging in general, right? Yeah, but like Yeah. So GDB is very powerful. It is also quite um, quite complex. So you you kind of need to understand a little bit more about the computer architecture and what needs to be kind of um, what metrics you're getting. So then you kind of understand what is actually happening, right? So of course it's a tool, you can just use it, but you need to understand the underlying execution framework to kind of get the best out of it. So we will try to cover that next week. Uh, we may not be able to go totally in depth. Uh, this topic is quite advanced. It kind of relates not only to debugging, but also to like performance optimization. So you can have a call graphs and you can analyze, you know, which part of the uh, code or functions are taking the longest time and so on. So there are a lot of useful things that you can get out of that topic. We will see how far we can get. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so let's, let's go. Um, we need to tidy up a little bit our student model because yesterday we just hard coded two students and we can ask about those two students and um, we can't really um, insert a new student, right? Uh, so it would be useful if we can refactor that into a code where we can, you know, actually um, add new students in. But before we do that, uh, let me just jump a little bit out of the current um, code that we have and look into the, the testing framework. So here we have uh, a very simple um, uh, code snippet which demonstrates how the typical structure of Go tests look like. So how many of you used unit tests before? What, and what frameworks did you use? Uh, I used Caps, which is also Okay. Yep. Um, so, why do we do unit tests in general? Uh, it's really easy if you if you have written tests uh, that define how the program should work and you do modifications. Mm -hmm. It's really easy to see if the program continues to yeah, behave. Works. Exactly. So, unit tests are kind of um, so usually when you work in a team you have uh, tasks allocated to you. So you say, I'm gonna write a handler to handle uh, get requests for students. And then you write your functionality. And on top of it, you write a little bit of testing. So then you make sure that your functionality works correctly, right? And then you commit the, those changes into the main truck, trunk of your repository. And the rest of the team will integrate or work with your code. And then as time goes on, people do modifications. And the tests that you left there are like the checks that the code continues to work as expected. So someone may change something, what your code needs, and then suddenly your code doesn't behave as it should because something else changed. So the tests are kind of a guarantee that those integrations and the mergers that different people put in and, and uh, contribute, they are retaining the functionality and the behavior of what was expected. Um, we write small and larger tests. Uh, we also write integration tests, which are larger tests which combine functionality of multiple building blocks. But here we will talk a little bit about the testing framework which is used for unit tests. And unit tests are usually tests for a single function or for a single class. They tr typically are quite small. Um, they try not to touch multiple uh, elements of the code base and they should be relatively fast to execute so you can run those unit tests very frequently. Um, of course it's a spectrum so when you move from unit tests to integration tests it's not like a binary jump. There is a, some tests are kind of still unit tests but they become a little bit bigger and bigger. You have to mock multiple elements for the unit test to work and at some point you, the 
you know, costs of maintaining a complicated unit test are not worth it, and then you kind of move to just testing multiple moving parts at the same time, and that's you definitely in the integration test zone, right? So there is a clear unit test zone and a clear integration test zone, and but you know, life is somewhere in between, and uh, there is no kind of a binary uh, jump from one to the other. So you can use a unit testing framework to test multiple functions or multiple objects at the same time. We tend not to do that because we want to keep the tests relatively small. Um, why do we want the tests to be relatively small? Well, we want tests to be bug-free. What happens if you write tests which has bugs? Well, bad things happen, right? I mean, you may have tests which are pass and they should not pass or you may tests which fail and then you have to debug your tests and maintain your tests because you know if the pr the system is working correctly then what do you do you know with the non working tests you have to maintain it and debug it right so that's why we try to keep unit tests as small as possible and as maintenance free as possible so we kind of guarantee that they are correct um, you know again life is sometimes a little bit different so even with small tests you may have bugs I had uh, a system, quite a complex system, uh, where we had uh, over 150 test cases for the system, and all the test cases were passing. Uh, and then it turned out that I came up with a scenario which demonstrated that the system is co incorrectly handling the inputs. It, it's not va correctly working, right? So n normally when you find out the bug, what you do, you write a small test which tests that there is a bug and fails, right? So it's a test which demonstrates that the system is not working and when you run the test, the test fails. So then you change the system until the test passes, right? So let's say we had 150 tests. I wrote this extra test that was failing. I fixed the system. The 151 test was passing now and I had 30 tests which used to pass, not pass, right? So I had 30 tests which were wrongly passing and they not supposed to pass because they were written the wrong way. And I had to fix all those 30 tests, right? Because after my fix, the system was actually correctly working. But before, even though I had 150 tests, it wasn't because like a huge chunk of the tests was missing a particular feature and was wrongly written to, to show that the system is actually working. Um, so what the lesson I learned was that it's useful to write tests actually before your system is working because then you are less biased, right? Um, so if you have some functionality that you want to test and you wrote that functionality, while you're writing the test, you usually write the test in a such a way that it will pass, right? <laughs> you don't... Um, yeah, it's kind of a bias when, when you already have something working. It's the same like you, you wrote something and then you're playing with it and testing it. You will rarely use a combination of keys that crash the system because you know subconsciously or consciously that you should not do that, right? Um, so that's why usually, usually in bigger companies, the testing department is not the development department because they don't have that bias. They will just test everything without kind of inherent bias of how things are actually built. Um, yeah, so I will stop here. I mean, we, we spent some time talking about tests and testing later in the third year, and then if you continue in the fourth year, but uh, all you need to know for now is that there is a framework, you should use it, and it's relatively easy to do. Um, the testing framework it works quite... Um, um, yeah, by conventions. So you have functions which are prefixed with the uh, with the test, uh, and then you pass them a parameter which is the testing framework reference to T. Uh, you can name it differently. The convention is to kind of use T. Uh, then you write the body of the like you're setting up something to test. So here I'm kind of mocking a JSON string as if I got the JSON string from the service, I have my data structure and I'm testing if the unmarshal function of JSON properly works for that input string, right? That it doesn't throw any exceptions, that it correctly unmarshals the string, this JSON string into the student data structure. So if there is an error, 
I'm saying t dot error, so I'm throwing, I'm telling the testing framework that something is wrong, the test should fail, because there should be no error. I don't expect this call to unmarshal to <coughs> fail. And then after this unmarshal is done, I'm testing if data dot name is uh, is different than Mariusz, because I expect um, data dot name to be Mariusz, right? So what is this test testing? Well, one thing that test is testing is the uh, go marshalling and unmarshalling of the JSON uh, strings, right? Uh, the other thing is that my name and age, um, it actually doesn't test age, but it tests that the name property of JSON is probably uh, um, properly inserted into the data structure of student, right? So the mapping between the, this name and the name of the student is correctly established. So this is a very trivial test. You may say, well, you know, how likely is that this will fail? It could fail if the specification for the JSON texts and the JSON fields is changed, right? If I, like in, um, sorry, if the, um, if the uh, person who is responsible for the rest and for the JSON changes the name to capital N, then this test will fail. It will not work anymore, right? Uh, and it, the test will catch it. Um, the actual behavior here, uh, I don't really need to test Go. Like, I can assume anything Go is doing is, is done correctly, right? But that's the convenient way of testing that the mapping is established. So if we go back um, to our code, we would like to have... Um, um, a way to make sure that our handling of students is done correctly. So we, we will redo this, this part, um, but before we do that, I would like to have a small API to allow me to um, uh, keep track of the uh, of students, right? So let's create a new file. Um, So we'll say it's a go file, and we'll say um, types test. And we will uh, write uh, a, a simple test case for um, setting up the student data structure. Uh, adding a student, removing a student, and uh, getting a student from that uh, from that data structure, right? I don't have any code written yet. I'm starting just with the test, right? So I can say um, test at student and testing team. So now uh, I would like to have um, wrong test signature, okay. So the advantage of writing tests first is also that you will feel what your API looks like or feels like even before you have it. So I don't have any structs or I don't have any methods or classes yet. I'm just using it. I'm using something that doesn't exist yet, right? Um, so um, I would like to have something to um, keep track of the students, right? So maybe I have like a students DB and it's called students DB and I can um, instantiate it. And then what I can do, of course, the code is not going to compile now, right? But I just get a feel of how it would feel like. And then I can say db at student. And then I can add, I can add a new student. So I can say um, student and students we already have. So I can say student Tom. 21, and then I expect um, I expect that now 
if I say um, DB count, it will say if DB count is different than one, um, we say T error wrong student count. And if I say if db so I can say get me give me the first student dot name is different than Tom then I have the error Um, student Tom was not added. Does it make sense to you? So I am imagining that I have some sort of a uh, data structure which I can instantiate, and I have uh, three calls on that data structure called add student, count, and get. Um, I can just for consistency just maybe say add count and get, right? Um, and it feels okay, right? Uh, I've already refactored it. So I initially said at student, but now I see that for consistency, it would be for my API point of view, it would be more consistent if I just, just say at count and get. All right, so what, the, of course, this test doesn't compile and doesn't, uh, I cannot even run it. Uh, because it doesn't compile, so I, I will create a new Go file. I will say um, students, and now we need this type. Uh, we called it students DB, which is a struct, and then we have to uh, keep track of the students somehow, right? So let's say we have um, students, and it will be a slice on top of a student. Um, and then I need um, three functions. So one was called add, and it was taking a student as a parameter. Uh, one, was take, one was called count, and it was no parameters, and it was returning a, a number. Uh, so let's say return zero and one was called get and it was taking an index and it would return a student. Okay, so I could say uh, return students Right? Students is not referred because I forgot that all those functions are working on the reference to the students DB. So I do this. And then say DB. Correct? Comments? Yeah? Uh, the test case, like, was that one assuming that uh, there was nothing in the database before? Or is yeah, uh, so, so this one creates an empty DB, oh. right? That deadline just instantiates me a, an empty DB, and then DB is just com completely new. I just did it in deadline. Okay, uh, again, small refactoring. I called this students and I called this types test. Well, it's a little bit inconsistent, right? Let's rename it uh, to be uh, consistent, right? So because the file is called students, I call it students test. Okay, so I have a, a file which is my 
normal code and I have a file which is my tests, right? And I currently have only one test. Um, so now if I add configuration and I say uh, go test and I say go test um, directory, I will say main tests. Let's see if I can execute it. Um, and then the, uh, it executed. Yeah, where do I get the Yeah, let me check. Well, if it works, you shouldn't get anything printed, should you? <coughs> well, you should get that this that that this test failed, right? Um because when I've added Tom, the count will return zero, not one, right? So that that test here should fail. Um, so I should have uh, information that it failed. Um, let me see. Do I need to say Let's say I do this Okay, so now I have some problems. Uh, students DB is unknown. Um, yes, it's unknown because it's I, I changed the the configuration to just file, and it's not a file because it needs to take um, the data from the hello. Um, Yeah, let me just do it quickly here. So this this is what I expect, right? I expect a test to fail, um, and I see which test was run. Is it clearly visible? So I was running the the test for the local folder. So I have my code here, and it says test at student failed because wrong student count, right? That's what I would expect from the from this failure here, right? So if I um, if I go to students and return one and rerun the test um, now I have the test not failing, the, the one about the, like this test is not failing, but I have an ex exception in this call because here I'm doing get me the student and this throws an exception, right? So again, the test fails because this line of code throws an exception, right? Because I actually don't have index one um, or index zero for that matter. So th this returns one, but and fakes me passing the test, right? So let's say let's return, let's re re implement that correctly, and then 
normally we would have to handle errors here, right? If I ask my function for something that it doesn't have, it should it should not throw an exception and kill the the, the program, right? If if I wrote that normally, that's a little bit untidy because you know it may happen that someone calls me with the wrong index. And what happens then is I have a runtime exception which kills my program, right? So normally what I should do is I should say, if um, I is outside of the range of my students, then I return an error, right? Um, so I could say, if I is um, smaller than zero and Um, I is bigger than length of DB students. Bigger equals? Yeah. That's nicer. Good, good catch. Uh, then uh, return uh, error new index out of range. And I have to say that I, I am normally expected to return a student, right? So now what we say, we are expected to return the student an error code. If there is um, an error, I will get an error. And then if everything is fine, I return nothing for the error. So this is a typical pattern for handling errors in Go, yes? What if you give it minus one? <laughs> then, then this will catch it and will say index out of range. It's yeah. It's yeah, 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 yeah. You're right, you're right. It should be or. Yep, perfect. Correct. So if it's minus one or if it's above the, the range, I'm throwing, uh, I'm returning a, um, a, a problem. And then if everything is fine, I'm returning a student and nil for an error. Um, they don't like me returning um, a nil for a student uh, because it says, you know, nil is not compatible with student. So I actually have to return like an empty student, right? So I say, okay, I have um, an empty student being returned, but there was an error, don't use it. Like, you know, it, it, it is just something I have to return. Um, and then if error is nil, then everything is fine. So then in my test, um, what I can say is, um, if I'm getting, so let's, let's do this. If student and error equals db get, and then if s is different than um, different than um, <coughs> yes so I also have to say now if I have an error um, then I'm saying t error and I can put error in, in there and then if s is not tom, I have another type of error. And then I'm closing it. And why this one doesn't like it? Do I need to unclose it? No. So what it says. <coughs> Works if you put it outside the if. On top of the if. Okay, so let's do that. And then we have um
yeah. Yeah, we can simplify that. <coughs> so every time I'm doing get, now I will get a student, but I also can get error, and then I have to check if there was an error, right? So the uh, the pattern here is that I'm returning something if everything was fine, but something empty with an error if something went wrong. And then on the calling side, we kind of do this and get an error if there was an error, and if it wasn't, then we can carry on. Uh, sometimes if you, um, if you don't expect an error to, be, to happen, you could handle it internally here. I could say, well, if someone passed me um, um, an empty, like a, a student outside of the range, I could say then I always return a student, uh, but here I print to my logger that, you know, someone called me with the wrong index, right? I don't expect this type of error to happen, so I will kind of log it and re um, log it and then return an uh, empty student and I wouldn't do that, right? It's an alternative way of dealing with the error condition. So the code will work, it will not crash my app. In the logger I will see, oh yeah, there is a bug somewhere in my code, right? Uh, someone was calling me with the wrong index, I have to investigate why that happened. Uh, but I'm not handling it with the error conditions, and then if I'm not doing that, um, so let's say we change, change the flow to this, I remove the, the nil, so then I simplify, um, I don't need to check for an error, right? In this particular case, this is probably more um, accurate because why would someone pass me a wrong index? Because the code is buggy, right? Uh, so the code needs to be fixed. As a programmer, I don't expect to get the wrong, wrong index. I mean, it is an error in a situation, but Normally, it should never happen. On the other hand, if you're doing an I.O. call, or if you're opening a socket, or if you're doing something which is outside of your control, even if your software is completely valid, it may still fail, right? If I'm opening a, a connection and there is no internet, it will fail. So then I have to get this error notification that you know something that failed beyond my control needs to be handled. Uh, but a wrong index is not something um, that should happen. Um, so there are different ways of dealing with it. One is to, to log it. The other one is to, to kind of uh, fail it, right? I can uh, throw runtime exception um, and force the, the programmers when they are doing, when they are using it to make sure that it never happens. But this has a risk that if I ship it into production, Sometimes the program will crash if there was a dynamically calculated index, right? So usually it's it's kind of better to kind of uh, to do the logging and notifying. So what can possibly go wrong with this? Well, that you know a student, empty student, will be used somewhere where it shouldn't be, right? Um, okay. So now um, let's where we were we were uh, running the tests. If we rerun it, um, students are not using errors. Yes, because we decided that we don't need it. So if we rerun it, then. Um, I have the test failing. It took uh, 0 0.1 second to run, and it fails in line 9 and line 13, saying wrong student count and student home was not added. Very nicely and tidy. No exceptions anymore. Before, the test was failing partially because of the code exceptions. Now we have exceptions handled, and it's not um, crashing. But both tests are failing, right? Um, Okay, um, when you're writing your tests and some, some uh, thing failed, 
sometimes you don't want to continue. You may kind of say uh, return here, right? If this thing is already wrong, I'm almost guaranteeing that everything under that is wrong as well. But it depends on the on the um, logic of the test. In our case, it probably would make sense for me to return here. If I failed with the count, you know, I'm not going to pass with get. Uh, but um, it's okay to leave it this way as well. So this test runs, and then this check runs as well. So then I get two notifications. Um, I don't know. I will figure out why the how how to configure the ID like in a break. So now we have to finish the implementation. So uh, we need to add the student, right? So what we can do is we can say um, db students append um, yeah actually it's just append append db students uh, and we say s right um, so let's check what append is returning Appending to a slice. Um, so it returns me a new slice, which is the one expanded by that element which which I've added, right? So in fact, in my code, I should say uh, DB students. And then we have this, and we have this. Should the test pass now? Let's check. No? Sorry. Yes? How did you add the test file so you can run it in, in the command line? Can you so it detect? will automatically detect the files which have the uh, test suffix. The test? Okay, so, it, so the test suffix here. Okay, underscore. Underscore test. So if you have anything else, it won't work. All right, so let's let's continue. I, I cannot figure out uh, yet uh, the testing and the IDE. So apologies for that. I will continue testing in the command line. Um, and for the code uh, problem that we had, the problem was that um, if I have a student's um, um, variable and I do those calls on that student variable, I am actually using uh, the convention by copy. I'm, I was not using a reference. So the changes we were doing to, like when we were appending to the, um, to the DB struct, that was happening on the copy of the DB, not on the actual reference. So we have to change the methods to operate on the reference to the DB. So then when we actually use it, um, and I have the reference to the DB, I'm actually operating add and count and get operate on the same uh, memory location. We don't uh, do it by copy, but we do it by reference. It's the same in C++, right? Uh, if I pass it by value and I modify it, the original value didn't change, right? Uh, so here I'm doing it now by, by reference, so then the original thing is changing. So if I rerun, so the test is the same. Uh, the code is the same. I only change that we are operating on the reference, not on the value. And then if I run the tests, okay. Um, some small problems here and then we run the test and it says pass okay everything is fine right uh, so we know that our small functionality for adding uh, students is working uh, we in fact uh, need um, let's write another test so let's write uh, another test which will say um, multiple st 
students. So I have um, Um, so let's have S1, which is a student. Um, Bob 21 and S2, which is also a student. And it'll be Alice. So now I can say uh, db is my uh, student db and db at s1 db at s2 uh, and you, you kind of see where I'm going with it, right? So I can do um, um, if db count is different than two, t error, wrong number of students, and if db get the first one, uh, dot name is different than the first one name then I say t error wrong name I would have to repeat it to s2 and at this point I'm thinking it looks kind of tedious for me to be uh, doing it for just two students repeating those db get and checking that everything is fine how if I just write uh, a for loop? So I say for um, for every student s in a range of, uh, and then I have this db, but I cannot get all the students. Um, I can kind of try to do this, um, but this is only available within my package, right? Which um, which might be okay, so let's let's stick to it. Um, let's not uh, optimize prematurely. So I would do db get. Um, so I would say if okay, I need an index. So I will actually have db get whoops, this and I would say s. I always write those stupid braces. Okay, so um, what does it do? It gets me all the students which I have in the db structure and it indexes them from zero onwards, like a kind of a normal for loop. So i is zero, one, two, and so on. And then s is the zeroth, first, second, and so on, right? So I can test all the db students if the db get i is the same as the s um, that I'm kind of getting here, right? But th this is, um, it kind of doesn't make sense. It has to be the same, right? Because the ith student is the student which has the s because I got it, right? I'm not actually testing it against s1, I'm testing it internally that the get function gives me the, the correct student, right? So what I need to do is I need to say um, for the student that I get from the D dbs, I need to test it with these guys. You understand this? So now I need another array or slice. So I say um, test data is my, um, I will have um, student and I will say I have two students.
So my test data is Bob and Alice. It's zero student for student. And here I'm, I will say test data of the of the ETH student name has to match the student that I have inside, right? Make sense? So now I can change, I can add extra student um, and have the tests uh, run the same way, although I would need to modify that as well. So I have to say for every student in the range of my um, test data, add this add this student to my DB. Right, so that's index and that's student. And because I'm not using index, I do this. So now for every student in the test data, add it to the DB, check if my count is correct. So if it equals test data count, right? And then check if the names are consistent. And then I can also do a consistency on the age to make sure that the age is also consistent. And now I can have 100 of students here and it will still continue to work and I don't need to modify my code. Only I, I only modify my code by adding extra students to my test case, right? So I can add, you know, as many students as I wish and the test should work. So let's test it. <laughs> runs fine. Um, so this is a kind of a useful pattern if you have multiple use cases, if you want to test something multiple times, so instead of repeating your code, you can write your test cases as a sort of data input and then just iterate all your tests in a, in a for loops. Right? All right, so um, we managed to extend our uh, scenario to be able to add and um, um, we don't have removal of students yet, mm -hmm. but let's let's say we don't have removal for now. So what we can do, we can refactor now this part, and instead of using this hard coded student um, two students that we had, we can start with zero students. So we can start with actually um, the the handler which response to the student requests will kind of do the job of um, answering of how much students we currently have and then uh, replying uh, with the appropriate data structure. So what we can do is we can um, we can change that um, we can basically remove this. We say okay if there is an error we uh, handle it. If there is, um, if we ask for all the students, we return all the students that we currently have in a database. Because I've deleted this internal thing here, now we like we need to somehow manage that. Um, so one way of managing that is we can in the main we can say I have. Um, um, I, I have it some, you know, data structure here, but then we would need to pass it to the handler, and then the handler would would need to be extended by the argument which I want to pass to it. So that's not ideal because the signature for the handler functions are kind of sealed, right? So that approach is not good. So alternative is I may have a global variable which holds my DB, but we don't like global variables neither. So um, what we can do is we can say, okay, I will have uh, local uh, data structures in my handler. So I will have, um, come on, I will have uh, a section here which kind of declares some 
it's not really global, but it's global for the handler of the student's uh, requests. So I will have a DB, which is my uh, student's DB. And this DB is kind of global here, is local to this function. And then I will use this logic as a router and I will have another function to which I can pass my, my students, right? So in, in here, I would like to say, um, uh, reply with all students and it takes w and db uh, and i will have my function reply with all students and it takes oops it takes um http response writer and db which is my uh, students db and what it does it says db students it is kind of a one-liner but it's still nice that i don't have a logic here i just use this logic as a kind of a, a routing um metaphor and then else i would say um reply with a student oh let's say with student and i need to pass w i need to pass the db and i need to pass the index of the student i need to reply with right um so i will have a function which says reply with student and it takes w which is the http response writer db which is the Students DB. You have to take the response <laughs> as a reference, don't you? Yeah. Yes. So, in fact, we should use um, references on all of those. And I need um, in, uh, index, which is the index of the student we need to return okay and then what we do is um we okay so all this logic is kind of not useful anymore um what we do is we say uh encode db get and we get the eth student right so now because we are getting the i not from a programmer we're getting the i from the uh, client side someone is requesting it right uh there is no problem for me to say um student zero uh, but I can say student 100, right? Anybody can do that. Uh, so I can have an invalid request because the ID is not found. It, it doesn't exist. I need the error handling. We, you know, we remove the error handling on get I, I. So I have to guarantee that my call to get I is correct. Uh, so I will have to um, make sure, um, make sure that i is valid so here i have to say if um db count is less less than i is that correct i think so yeah then what we do, we say error, um, error, um, and then again we have this discussion of um, you know error codes. So what error code should we use? Um, we could use 404, and we could say um, HTTP status text 404. By the way, again, I'm using magic numbers. You 
typically would need to say, well, that's don't, let's don't do that. Let's say HTTP status no um actually it's um it's status so if i say where were the all statuses if you were http i think i you have to say http status yeah so i say not found right yeah, so that that's nicer if, if you do that instead of uh, putting numbers, even though the status codes are kind of um, fixed, they're not going to be changed. It, it's better to use those. So I'm handling the invalid thing and I will return. But if the I is valid, I can do this, right? So now I have my kind of logic. Um, yeah. Yeah. Less equal, isn't it? So if I have four items and you're asking for the four, then it will not work because I only have in indexes still three. So equal will not do it. Yeah. But that's the error. Yeah. So that's correct. So it should be equal. You're right. Um, so error is if count is less or equal to i, because for i we cannot handle it neither. Okay, so there is one extra thing that we're missing. we missing i. Um, yeah, all right. So uh, here we also have to say... Ah, oh, come on. We're actually passing the references instead of the by copy. And when do you start? When do you use the. Um, uh, okay, let, let me just do the I and then we come back to this. So, how do I get I? Um, I have to have an index, which is uh, I, which is an int, and I have to do ASCII to int, right? So in C, you would do you would do this, uh, and the parts two would be the text, which is your number, right? So what we can do is we can ask, okay, go, okay, string convent, con, there is a function called atoy, but it is, in the module called <coughs> string conversions. So I need to say string conversions. And then I have <coughs> Atoi and it says, okay, let's go back here. So if I go to A toy I see it returns me an int and error if the parsing didn't happen so this function converts a string to an integer and returns an error if there was a problem right so I would actually have to say um, error if yeah I use a variable yep so I say if no brackets error is different than nil then we have to handle it again okay how we handle it so someone passed me a url which is of this form and this thing is not a number 
So it passed me some sort of a text which I cannot parse into the integer. How should I handle it? Uh, well, let's say we say HTTP error and we say yeah, what error code we should use. Um, status bad request. HTTP status text HTTP um, status bad request. Okay. And we don't send anything, so we say return. Okay. So the question was when do we use um, um, reference and when we do use star? So it's the same as in C. So the star says we passing something by reference. So when you're declaring a type, you're saying um, the value here will be passed by reference, right? Um, it's the same as in C++. And here we're saying the value here is being passed by reference, yeah. right? Yeah. And then uh, when we're passing the arguments, um, and here we have the reference, like uh, we actually have a value to W, right? Uh, and we, if we said W here, we would pass a copy to another W. If we say, give me the reference to W, we use this ampersand. So it, derif like, it gives you back a reference to the data structure that you have. So if, if W was, uh, if W was passed here by uh, by reference, then this would be passed by reference. But because W is passed by value, you have to get the um, the reference to it by the ampersand. There is a, a small um, yeah. There is a small um, yeah. The, the address basically. Uh, there is a small uh, thing here that, uh, where is our test here? So here we have, is student DB a reference to student DB? Is DB a reference or a, or a value? Uh, <clears throat> is there, <clears throat> uh, it's a reference. It's a value. <coughs> Why? Because I, uh, th this is not, um, <coughs> I didn't say um, I didn't say this. If I said this, DB would be a reference. Yeah. But because I didn't say ampersand, I said this. This is by value, right? So DB is the actual struct. I mean, yeah. I mean, we say this is a variable which references the struct, right? Yeah. But it's not referencing it by reference. It's actually referencing by value. <laughs> yeah, but it's not so, so if I do this, oh, sorry. If I do this, nah, then DB, like, OK, what's the type of DB? The, yeah. type, the type of DB is the pointer to student DB now, right? Yep. That's what DB is. Yep. But if I do this, then it's this. Right? So, but the add method, you see, the add method expects to get a reference, not by value, right? Yeah. Did you say that the difference between the star and the ampersand is uh, compiled time versus runtime, sort of? Um, you, okay, not no, really it, it's all, it's both compile time, but okay. there is a kind of compile time shortcut. So the <laughs> normally what we need to do here, we would need to say, I want, um, what we would need to say is, we would need to say, I need a reference to DB, and then I will call the method on the reference. I would, technically I would have to say this, and it's a valid statement and it would work fine. But there is a syntactic shortcut which says, if I expect to call a method on the reference, but you pass me by value, I will do that automatically. So Go converts this call, 
this call which I did to this call uh, which which I supposed to do automatically for you and so the compiler doesn't tell you that there is some sort of a problem if you mess something up because it, it kind of does it automatically right uh, which leads sometimes to small problems like what we had originally right originally we had code like this and it was not working because we were passing by value not by reference and now we have the code like this which is exactly the same and now we're passing by reference because magically compiler does it for you right it it may lead to some bugs in your code because you actually see code like this and you say where what's wrong and you don't see what's wrong but if you were forced to do this uh then you would see okay i'm like if i see code like this you know you're passing by value but if you see code like this you know you're passing by reference right <laughs> so i actually don't like that feature of go that it makes it makes it convenient for you to to write it like this um but you know nobody writes like this i mean it's like so much writing that nobody does it so everybody does this right but it may lead to some some problems later on so watch it out so here if i were to properly do it i would probably do this right because then my db is the reference and then this is you know explicit db is explicitly a reference to student db right um yeah, so let's leave it like that. That's probably a little bit more, um, um, yeah, orthodox kind of way of doing it. Yep. Is calling it a reference with looks a lot like a pointer in C++? Is it called a reference with acts like a pointer? Or? It's a pointer. You can say it's a pointer. Yeah. So technically it is a pointer. It's not a reference in the C++11 sense. Yeah, it's a, it's a good, good point. You, I, I should say... The DB is a pointer to students DB now. It's, it's, it's a kind of an address. Is it called references in Go or is it pointers also? Um, I don't remember. I, I think it's called pointers. Um, but I think it's also called references. <laughs> it's, it's, all, it's not many languages that separates the two. Yeah, so weird. De definitely in C++ you separate. Clearly there are different semantics when you say reference and a pointer. Uh, here it is kind of intermingled, I think. So they, I think they use it interchangeably, uh, but I'm not sure. <coughs> All right, so um, where are we? We need to uh, test if our uh, changes actually work, right? So now, um, what, like, you know, to test it, I actually need to run it. So I have to say we're running a main. I run it, and then it says, whoa, 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 what are you doing? You're passing um, IO writer as a reference where we expect to pass something rather differently. <laughs> so I have to say, every time I was passing it by, uh, reference by address I have to dereference it right um, so I have to say um, dereferencing it uh, and here it's okay and here I am dereferencing it and I'm um, DB students is okay so let's try it again okay now it works do, do you understand why I had to dereference the references because the encoder needs a value. It doesn't want the reference. It wants a value. So I, uh, I cannot pass a reference. I have to pass the value. So I'm like dereferencing the reference now. So dereferencing the pointer. <laughs> right? So now it became like the value type, not the... Doesn't that mean that you didn't have to pass it as a reference at all? Yes, that means that, but if I pass it by value, then I would be making a copy. So yeah, I could... It's already a pointer. I could do this, right? Mm -hmm. I could do this uh, and say I am actually passing it by, um, by value. And if this is a pointer <laughs> type, then it, it just works fine, right? So we can stop it and rerun it and it will work fine. 
uh, I forgot something somewhere. Um, yeah, here. Again, I'm forgetting somewhere some the references. So line sixty-nine. Right. So we not passing. We passing DB by reference, but we passing W just plain. Okay. So now I say allow, and now I go to my test case, and now I tested with rubbish. And it says bad request. Okay, that's good. I tested with a number which is too big. And it says not found. We don't have a student 120. I tested with student 0. And it also says not found because we actually have 0 students, right? We have an empty database. So we got to a point where we kind of refactored uh, our system somewhat and it works relatively well. Um, how would I test, how would I write a test which does what I just did? What you could do, and that would be a little bit of an integration test, you could write a function, uh, you could write a test function which instantiates the server, instantiates the client, ask the client with get requests for a particular student, and checks the headers of what the server replies with, right? So if I got 404 for the uh, not existing student, and if I got 200 for, I actually cannot get 200 now because we have zero students, right? The only case where I can get 200 is this case. I say, I want all the students that currently are here. That's the only use case right now which gives me 200 and responds with what? Uh, why it says bad request? Because, yes, because we have a bug. Uh, so what we would expect from this API to return is the array of all the students, which in our case should be an empty array. Instead, it parses the ID and says, you know, your ID is empty string, it's not a number, so you have a bad request, right? So we have to add a kind of unusual test case uh, where we say, Okay, if um, so, yeah, so um, okay, so we have the conversion of the empty string here. And if, it's, if it was empty string, error will be not nil, and it will run this. The test for the empty string happens here. So what, what do I need to do to make it work? The easiest way is you can notice that I don't need i until here. So I can basically, sorry, I can basically take these four lines, test if it wasn't empty string, and then do that here. Make sense? So we had kind of a bug which we didn't notice earlier, uh, that our original request for asking for all the students was not working. So let's double check it. So now if I ask for student zero, I get not found. If I ask, oops. If I ask for a student with the malformed ID, it's a bad request. But if I ask for a student, I get um, I got null. Well, that's not ideal neither, right? What I would expect is I would expect to get uh, like an empty array, right? I would expect to get JSON, which is an empty array. Um, so now, okay, so let's check. Reply with students. Um, we say if it's with, okay, so here we're saying, oh no, that's not that one, that one. Um, the DB students is null. Um, so let's do this. If 
no brackets, if db students is nil, uh, then else do this. So we kind of do Let's try this. Um, student. Why doesn't like an empty array? Right, so I have a slice which points to an array which is empty. Let's see if the JSON encoder kind of deals with that correctly. So I say if DB students is nil, then pass instead an empty slice to an empty array, which should be just the the brackets. Um, Let's check. We ask for all the students, and that's what is good to get back, right? Um, all right, so what's left now is to write the client side, which will uh, be able to put new students in. Uh, and to do that, we can use the, uh, we can fake it with the postman. So the only thing which we would like to do here is to write uh, a handler which would uh, respond. So currently, if I do this, um, if I do um, get student, I get a list, an array of all the students which are in the database. If I say post, I may post a JSON structure which will be my student and will get um, um, I will get a side effect, which is inserting the, the student into the, uh, the data structure. Christopher would say, no, 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 don't use post, use put, right? It would be a kind of more idiomatic way of using a REST API. Because we're changing. Sorry? Because we're changing the fields. Yeah, so we can, um, so which one would be the most natural? If you're adding a new item, you're not changing, you're adding a new student. Post. post. So what we do is we fake it. So we here have um, my student. I am saying um, instead of get, I will do post. And my body will be um, um, row. So I want to type it. And I want to have a JSON, which will have name, say, uh, Tom. And it will have h, say, 21. And then that's my body of my request. I'm using the post. I would like to set a header uh, to be, um, so headers, I will say application JSON. Um, and then all looks good. And I send, send it to my server. And my server responded with um, status 200 OK and with the body saying empty, right? So what the server did, it responded to my post request exactly the same way as to get request. It basically said, OK, everything is fine. This is the list of all the students, completely ignoring my body, right? So that's a little bit problematic because that's not what we intend. So what we intend is we say here handler student and we say um, if the request a header um, no it's uh, what's the method if the request method is um, equals get do all of that right but if it's post do something else. So we say, uh, you know, I will say return here. 
So it will behave the default way for... Um, I, I don't want to enclose the whole thing in, in braces. So it will behave for put and for delete right now like this, like get. Uh, in fact, you should be specific about get. And then if there is a post, we would like to say um, error. Uh, and we will say, so we will use the HTTP status not implemented. The, we don't have yet implemented the um, the adding new student, but at least we handling post now correctly, right? So let's let's check it. So we rerun it and we allow it, and then we go here and we send the request again. Um, well, it didn't work quite well. It's running. Okay, why this doesn't go? So let's say I have post student body is my body row headers. Um, Mm. Yeah, but that's the so this is what I got back. This is what yeah, let's see. Uh, so here I have to specify the apply. No, those are the parameters. No, we don't want the parameters. We want the headers for the request. So content type and the value is application JSON. So we want this header for the request. So this part is the response I'm getting. This part is the um, header and um, so parameters we don't want parameters we have a header we are doing post and we're running it and it doesn't do what we expect so uh, request maybe this let's print it so let's say format um, print line and let's say error method. So we will see what method is being used in the console. So let's say we run it again. We run this again. And then it says it's get. Uh, why it's get? <laughs> when I just said it's post. So this, this thing is a bit buggy because I'm trying to do post. Um, it's, uh, in the body, uh, uh, <clears throat> no, we can try with a slash, but it says post. Yeah. Clearly it says post. Um, Not implemented. Yay! Finally, some reason. It may, maybe it was caching it or something. So here, now we're getting post, right? So now if I do, yeah, if I do this check, I have it working correctly, right? So in fact, you, it would be useful to uh, to handle um, to say the if check if if method is you know is get sorry you do the um, um, the um, the logic and then if it's not get then you say else and then you you throw a generic exception saying because as you see there is a number of um, of um, things that can be issued towards your API if you only handling get and post then you probably should ignore or should 
send something like not implemented or a bad request for all those other ones, right? So the best thing is to, ha to handle the ones that you handle and then for everything else you say uh, not implemented or something. So you have a kind of a else close at the end. All right, so we finish today here. Uh, we have a skeleton of where to uh, implement the, uh, the post behavior and then what we will do next, we will quickly do that with the with this um, um, postman, so we can issue requests with the logic with, with the data and get the server properly handle that, and then we will write the client, so, which will actually be doing that instead of us manually doing that, right? And then we talk a little bit about debugging as well. So that's the plan for the next session. If I get the time. This week, for an extra session, I will post it on Blackboard. If not, we just meet on uh, Monday. All right? Questions? Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat>